been going well. Um, a lot more take up also of the uh, business uh, grant support uh, program associated with Healthy Davis Together that's, uh, that's been very well received uh, too. Um, the, uh, um, and I know there's, we'll talk about it in the, during the agenda, but there's a, obviously a significant component of HDT and that ties in directly with the school, uh, school reopening uh, process here too. Um, from also from a uh, on the topic of COVID, there's the federal relief funds uh, bill that was passed, uh, and those funds are expected to start distribution uh, next month, at least for the first half, and then the second half, and uh, basically a year after that, uh, we uh, are going to be going to our city council uh, at their next meeting, which is on the 20th and suggesting that the council form a subcommittee uh, that would work with staff to develop uh, proposed uh, sort of uh, principles and criteria for how those funds uh, will be utilized uh, moving forward. The city's uh, portion of that is approximately 18 million. Um, so in, again, in two chunks of roughly 9 million each, um, although we are still working to uh, get a, gain a clearer understanding of exactly what the funds can and can't be used for uh, from the Department of Treasury. Uh, so we'll keep we'll keep our eye and, and keep you posted on those discussions as they progress uh, into May. Um, and uh, then other, of course, with the city, you know, hot topic of late has been uh, community policing. Uh, that was the basically the sole subject, if you will, of last night's city council meeting. Um, and excellent discussion and in, in my view by the city council uh, really taking into account the work of a joint subcommittee uh, that had done quite a bit of work on this last year uh, and then last night was sort of the opportunity if you will for staff to provide some uh, perspective uh, as well. Uh, council uh, worked through uh, the matter uh, in its entirety last night um, so we wrapped up, I think, just before midnight, Will, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Um, so definitely a very good, yeah. excellent discussion around that. Um, and the outcomes, um, uh, uh, I'd say, very much in line you know, with uh, what the staff recommendations were for those who were tracking the, the staff report or the recommendations on that. There were many, many recommendations. Um, I think we were up around 23 recommendations or so uh, regarding policing, some of which are already in the works and have we've already been working on and Chief Pytel has already been working on. Some of them uh, will take a bit of time to implement uh, and uh, some, a few of the uh, recommendations too are ones that will take um, uh, more consideration and more uh, discussion at, in understanding before uh, deciding if and when to implement them. So last night, it, to that end, the city council established two subcommittees last night. Uh, one subcommittee is of Will and uh, Mayor Partita. Um, and that subcommittee will be focused on working with staff on uh, evaluating some organizational uh, ideas and options uh, around some functions that are currently in the police department that may be considered for uh, a different organizational structure, namely code enforcement and uh, parking enforcement, um, but not necessarily limited to. Uh, and then there's another subcommittee uh, that is uh, Lucas and Josh. Uh, they will be focusing in and working with us on uh, basically the, what we'll refer to as sort of the co-responder model uh, for, with the County Health and Human Services uh, that creates a, a platform by which uh, calls uh, for service, especially mental health crisis, um, uh, can be diverted uh, from uh, uniformed officers to mental health uh, clinicians uh, instead. And so we sort of generally refer to it as a co-responder model because it's a coordinated approach. Um, but uh, that those two subcommittees will be uh, working with us moving forward on those uh, specific issues. Um, so that was, that was last night's meeting really. Uh, and then the next uh, meetings, as we start to get into May, uh, we'll start becoming more focused on budget uh, and budget proposal and uh, the, the COVID relief funds and so forth. So that's the updates I had for tonight, thanks.
Cool. That was really interesting. Thank you. Does does DJUSD work with um, the police on any sort of like CTE or internship or like that sort of, do we have programs like that? I, I'm not familiar with uh, with any internship programs. I know we in the past have had sort of, um, what is it called, the cadet program? Um, I call it thing, yeah. yeah it, I'm not sure what the age, the age brackets are for the cadet uh, program though offhand high, high school age usually but it's i don't believe that it's um i don't know that there's ever been a four credit component to it um just, it's more of a you know outside extracurricular if you will um and then we have off and on had a school resource officer component um where we have an officer or officers who are designated to work specifically and partner specifically with the schools but we don't have that right now but at the moment, no, because there's <laughs> okay. no place to go. Um, are there any comments on the communications? Cool. Do you mean public comment or comment from? Do, do I ask for public comments at every on every item? I don't recall if we take public comment on this type of stuff, but if you want comment from me, I've got a couple. Yeah, oh. we tip, we typically don't take public comment on every item unless That's someone right. is you know boom, burning the uh, the hand digital hand raising and then <laughs> uh, and then uh, and then we do. But um, yeah, we usually don't. You get, um, trust you, you, you get me outside, and I forget how these meetings even work. Well, I'm inside, and so I'm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Will, you said you had some comments. Just, I I just want to say thank you, and uh, um, uh, I don't know. If what the right word is, but uh, a note of appreciation to the district folks, you know, my, my counterparts on the school board and, and, uh, and the district staff. I know this has been a, uh, um, a lot of work and a difficult time over the last couple of months, but culminating over the last couple of weeks with regard to um, the ever-changing nature on this end of COVID. We all experienced how everything was rapidly changing a year ago. Now it's somewhat rapidly uh, changing and thankfully in the opposite direction, but it, um, I know it really put pressure on you guys to, um, to find a landing spot. Uh, my kids are incredibly excited to go back to school. In fact, um, this was not my proudest parent moment, but uh, I saw it online. I thought it was hilarious. So on April Fool's Day, I told them, Get in the car. School's open today. They just texted us all. And they oh. were like, I've never seen a backpack get put on so fast. Uh, so they fell for it. But oh, man. They were, they were a little bit, Tanya in particular, was a little bit sad when I, when I pulled back the curtain. And so I felt bad. But she was the one that had been egging me on the night before. Hey, what are you going to do? Are you going to take us for April Fool's? And so anyway the point is they're super duper excited to get back i'm excited uh to, to get them back i i um the questions that we had last week uh are, are being answered right now in terms of what their schedule is going to be and get them back i feel i feel very good about the process uh even even though there's been changes uh as we approached the opening day there were changes but as a parent look, we're trying to roll with the punches. And so I, I just really appreciate the work you guys are doing. And then I will say on the um, uh, policing issue, uh, and I'm glad either Kelly or Mike uh, mentioned it, but there are some uh, school district facing, campus facing uh, activities that the police engage in. Um, and those have been called out by folks in the community as, as a potential for um, sort of a different uh, ripe for reimagining, perhaps, uh, in terms of uh, of how you know certain issues on campus uh, um, interact with law enforcement, or or uh, and so uh, certainly as we go down this path, uh, the mayor and I go down the path of of uh, looking at potential uh, uh, alternatives to armed police response to things. Uh, I think there may be uh, a great opportunity for us to get input from the district in terms of uh, of your guys's needs and 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 maybe um, you know share in the in the thinking about how to address those issues. So look forward to that, I suppose. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, it's good to hear about your kids. And yeah, for sure, let's keep the <laughs> open. Um, sure. President Denunzio, did you have any comments? No, other than, well, that was a very nice thing to say and super pleased that your children are excited to go back. I know there are many uh, that are looking forward to being back in school. And um, I do want to um, thank our staff for all of the hard work, um, the teachers, the uh, the staff members, district staff. It's been, it's definitely been uh, a challenging time for all of us in the community. You know, certainly the city has done an amazing job as well. I guess the only thing, so I lied, Trustee Asmus, I do have a comment. The only thing is, you know, we remember to come back to the sort of core principles of kindness, compassion, and empathy for each other because we all have our own journeys and challenges and it's hard to know what's going on in someone else's life. And, you know, now more than ever, as we go through a transition, a change, uh, those values are going to be so important for us. Um, and I too am optimistic, uh, Will, that things really seem to be going in the right direction. We don't want to get overconfident, but boy, it does feel so much better than even six weeks ago uh, in terms of where we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have more to talk about when we get farther into the Healthy Davis Together agenda item. Uh, so moving on to the discussion items, starting with coordination of return to school. Great. Um, uh, I know that an important topic always for the start of the school year and for our return on the 12th is a safe way to get to school. And an important part of that are uh, crossing guard and campus supervisors. And let me ask Matt if you could um, give us a brief update on that. Uh, crossing guard and campus supervisors. Yeah, so, uh, it's, I, you kind of were cutting out there at the end. Specifically, you want me to talk about crossing guards? Is that what you said? Yeah, so um, I think that we just ha had a schedule finalized on crossing guards today, I think. And um, we've, I think the company has them secured. Um, I think we were reaching back out to them to see if any of them were interested in being employed in the morning time in between their sort of eight o'clock and 1130 time uh, uh, to help with campus supervision. Uh, so I know Laura was going to reach out to uh, city staff and the the provider to see about to see about that um but uh yeah i think we've got it lined up uh all the principals especially at the elementary site have been securing um campus supervision support to help uh wrangle all of the students that will arrive on monday to their designated locations at the designated times um, and we're continuing to talk with our uh, association partners we have a tentative agreement with csea as of uh, yesterday and uh, still working with DTA to finalize some of those details. So we're getting there. And I would just note that the crossing guards are scheduled for the same um, locations that we normally have them. So uh, the crossing guard portion will look normal. <laughs> the, their times are a little different than they than they would do in a, a, a regular year, obviously to adjust to the um, the different school schedules, but. And on that related related note to the the topic of uh, safe safe routes to schools, and and John, forgive me if you're already going to cover this, but uh, our with our safe routes to schools program, we've been putting out messaging, uh, including uh, I just looked at one on our Facebook page uh, about uh, safe routes to schools, and really getting the the word out to the community to please be on the lookout, you know, for kids and families now, you know, traveling to and from school and uh, to be cautious and to remember those uh, safe driving practices and so forth when they're out there. Uh, and I know that uh, Chief Pytel is also uh, coordinating with his patrol uh, staff, you know, to, you know, be extra vigilant and eyes out there, you know, uh, helping out with keeping tabs on, on those things. So people have been gone an awful long time without a lot of kids being out on the streets and on those routes as we know. And so um, some different behaviors and driving behaviors have settled in, I'm sure in the last year that probably aren't particularly conducive to <laughs> to it. So we're I think, getting word out as, as uh, much as we possibly can about those reminders. So, and the good thing is that the parents themselves typically are, are some of our best eyes and ears out there to help <laughs> peer 
peer review and peer pressure, you know, the good behaviors. So. Great. Likewise, we have ample material um, on our website and guide the school sites as well uh, for families about all of the you know, safe practices that will be asking students to engage in, and that includes, you know, parking bike, that bike rack. Uh, they'll be lining up differently um, on the blacktop prior to the start of school. Everything from hand washing, going to the restroom, uh, nutrition, or lunch breaks, recess, uh, all of these will be different uh, than what they need same time, there'll be a lot that is uh, familiar to them, but especially for our students who have never been on uh, their campus before, especially kindergartners, uh, seventh graders, and uh, tenth graders, uh, great opportunity uh, for them. So, excitement is palpable, and uh, can't wait for April 12th. So in addition to the crossing guards, which the city plays a part in, um, we are also working to get the active for me program. That's the, the scanning program when a child arrives to school, if, if a parent wants to receive notification that that child has arrived safely. Um, we're working with our volunteers to get that back up and running. Um, that one may take a little while longer. There's some equipment uh, challenges we're having where it's, um, the program isn't working on some phones and we don't have, you know, laptops or anything that we can give out. So um, more to come on that, but they are working on it to try to get it all to work. Um, do you need volunteers for that or you're, you've got all that sort of, you know, who's going to do that already? Um, I think they're always happy to have volunteers. Um, so if you have, if you have somebody you want to send them our direction, I can get them hooked up with the right staff person. Okay, cool. Um, do we, is that the whole update? Is there more? You want to cut Mike or John off? Unless there are questions, that's the update for today. President Donzio, do you have any questions or comments? <clears throat> uh, I do not. That was all very clear. Thank you. Council Member Arnold? No, I'm good. Thank you. Sounds good. Moving on to COVID-19 updates. John, do you want to sort of pick up with the, your your role on uh, back to school and the tie-in with COVID and HGT testing and such? Yeah, so a couple things happening. One, you'll see a press release coming out from the district tomorrow about the return to campus. And uh, that will likely go out in advance of a UCB Live uh, Facebook uh, streaming event that will feature uh, David Coyle from UC Davis, who is the expert uh, who's been very instrumental in helping make sure that our uh, HVAC system and filter testing uh, program are in place, uh, and me. And we will be um, discussing with the moderator um, how we have uh, readied our campuses for a safe return uh, for students and staff, and then fielding some questions uh, from the public uh, live time. Uh, but the partnership with Healthy Davis together uh, continues to uh, be a terrific uh, collaborative uh, partnership uh, between the city, uh, the university, uh, and the school district. And we look forward to continuing that work uh, through the rest of this school year and as we prepare for expanded summer school offerings and our intent to fully return to campus on August 25th. And we will be uh, offering, we intend to offer a full regular program for families that wish to return in full and a standalone uh, distance learning program, a distance learning uh, academy as you will. Uh, because we know some families um, have let us know that uh, they actually prefer and or their students are doing better uh, in distance learning than in uh, their previous 
experience. Uh, another important update and um, the rules just have changed within 24 hours, but vaccines are becoming readily available for 16 uh, years uh, and older. Um, and you will see updated messaging on the district uh, website uh, if it hasn't happened already uh, later this evening. Yesterday, what the guidance was, you needed to be in a specific uh, category like food service worker as a teenager or have an underlying medical condition. Uh, the update we received today is uh, anyone 16 and older uh, has access to the vaccine uh, through the UC program. Um, so we are um, you know, very pleased to be able to announce and to offer expanded vaccine uh, access for more and more students and staff. Good, thanks, John. Uh, from a city standpoint, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the Healthy Davis Together partnership continues uh, moving forward. Uh, in all the same elements and respects that it has uh, for, for several months now with the business partners program uh, still uh, sort of in full, in full swing with um, incentives, grants, uh, PPE support for businesses. Uh, there's the Aggie ambassadors who are, are in the downtown and in the community, including farmer's market and so forth, just helping to sort of spread the word about safe practices. Uh, so that's continuing forward. We have the quarantine and isolation uh, component of the program that has been uh, quite successful. It's been used uh, uh, a, a fair number of times since the inception uh, and successfully uh, housing folks who needed to sort of be you know, separated from roommates and so forth. Um, uh, I don't believe it's currently in use, but um, and it hasn't been for, I think, several weeks, which is a good sign. Quite honestly, I mean that's that's a good thing in, in our view, but it's still a program that's available and at the ready as needed, uh, should the need arise uh, for it. Um, we also have uh, the testing, as I mentioned, the testing is uh, continuing to to be a fairly steady stream of of folks continuing to do that, and the key messaging uh, for the last couple of months as vaccines have started to roll out, the key messaging has been on. Um, really trying to encourage folks to continue to test even after receiving uh, uh, their vaccines um, because it has, it's not clear that those who have received a vaccine can't still carry the virus in their respiratory uh, tract and so forth and, um, and be able to um, infect others even if they are themselves are uh, immunized uh, against it. So uh, that's been a, a key message and one that's been, I think, um, a little tougher uh, for people to sort of uh, get a handle around, <laughs> you know, conceptually, They're like, well, why I've already been vaccinated. And um, so just trying to trying to explain that a bit. Um, there's also the effluent testing, which is basically our wastewater system testing. Uh, it's continued to go and uh, go forward. It has a dashboard on the website uh, that provides relative data. Um, so you can sort of track certain segments of the city and it's at a fairly broad scale. So it's not down to the street or cert and certainly not to the address level of testing. It's sort of big chunks of the city. Uh, you're able to go in and, and sort of take a look at trends over time uh, and if things are trending up or down or staying steady and compare that to the same neighborhood over time, compare it to other neighborhoods and then also compare it to the testing that we do at the end of the stream, if you will, which is our wastewater treatment plant where we also are doing testing. Uh, and obviously that's sort of a testing of the entire city. Um, so that's that's continuing to go strong. Uh, the campus has been, I think, very enthusiastic about, I'll say, about that program, primarily because I think they're uh, interested in uh, what effectively is new science that's being developed literally, you know, around things like wastewater stream testing for public health purposes. And this is, you know, they're literally sort of writing the playbook uh, for not only for COVID on this, but how it may be applicable to future, you know, um, 
uh, benefits uh, associated with that kind of testing. So uh, glad that we can be in a supportive role in helping with that uh, that that program and that what effectively is a research project in many respects. So um, and um, I think that covers the primary elements of HDT. Uh, we have our uh, yesterday the state announced, as folks probably saw, the, a June fifteenth uh, target date for basically opening up the whole state, um, subject to a few um, parameters around larger events uh, in venues and conferences and such, but also with continued practice, safe practices of face coverings and. Uh, you know, hand sanitizing and, and such uh, moving forward. But um, that was, that news came out at the same time as news locally was coming out that we had through HDT testing discovered the African uh, COVID variant in Yolo County uh, in, in a Davis resident, in fact. Um, so just like the HDT testing identified the one of the other variants uh, back in February, this variant is now here um, and that person is in isolation quarantine and getting appropriate care and, and support, uh, of course, but the message is, is still the same largely, which is this new, the African variant is 50% more readily transmittable uh, than I'll call it standard COVID-19. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's there's there is some concern that the efficacy of the vaccines is not as is not as great uh, with this new strain. So the combination of those factors can be concerning when uh, we don't have vaccine rollout quite as much as I think we'd probably all like to see just yet. Although it seems to be accelerating. Uh, so, but the message is the same, which is you know vigilance, uh, face coverings, um, washing, you know, et cetera, um, and just taking safe safety precautions. Um, but uh, so both of those bits of news came out almost simultaneously yesterday, which is sort of, you know, this interesting juxtaposition of messaging. Um, but um, so what else? Uh, Kelly, anything else that you can think of here in terms of, um, I'm thinking in particular, like sports athletic youth camp programs and such that we're doing, we're basically opening up as much of that as we reasonably can while ensuring safe practices. So uh, things like adult softball league will be starting up in May um, and other uh, youth programs. The registration starts, I think it's next week, a week, uh, just about a week from now. Yeah. 13th, I think. So, uh, but am I missing anything there, Kelly, that. No, I think you've, I mean, you've covered it as you know, just, just as the school district is doing, we're trying to um, adjust and adapt every time the state or the County changes the rules of the game. So um uh, we're trying to focus on as many outdoor things as we possibly can. Um, a lot of our recreation programs, both for youth and adults, uh, since that's there's a little more certainty there, but um, our facilities will be opening up uh, again soon, at least with the announcement yesterday, we'll be able to take reservations in the summer. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Thank you, that was awesome. Um, Councilmember Arnold, do you have any comments or questions? No, I uh, we got um, uh, much of that update from Mike last night too, and it is such an interesting juxtaposition that we have the announcement of the reopening, and then we thankfully we have Healthy Davis together, so that we're finding these variants um, right away, uh, and that's why the last two that we found have been through Healthy Davis together because so many folks getting tested, and so um, uh, and it was good to to know that uh, that person, you know, of course contacted and it's isolating and all those things um so you know as as uh, joe said uh you know we're, we're still very optimistic uh, we're still you know um making sure that we're safe but but i uh, you know the kids are ready to go back to school they're ready to go do these uh summer things so now's the time <laughs> uh, the the die is cast now i think as they say Thanks, President. You. Um, just one question, and it's sort of a, a specific one, but really just a curiosity: is um, any um, uh, visibility to you know pools are so important for families and kids in the summertime. 
any sense of the probability of the community pools being open uh, for the summer, swim lessons, things like that? Yeah, so um, as the rules keep changing, we continue to meet and try to, to change what we're doing. Right now, we're just offering lap swim, um, public lap swim. And um, our hope is to be able to uh, open up the aquatic facilities for recreation swim in some capacity for the summer. Um, exactly what that looks like, whether or not we have any kind of special um, restrictions in place, which is what we're planning right now, versus um, not having any of those restrictions in place, I think still remains to be seen and see where we are. So, um, but yeah, we, we understand that the community would love to be able to hop in the pool this summer. They missed yeah, that. Of course, if it's, if it's safe and it meets the state and county guidelines. Of course. Yeah. So we've been taking, I mean, we, you know, this entire time, we've really been taking our lead from the, the state and county requirements and guidelines. So um, we'll continue to do that. That's my only question. Thanks. Yeah, that, I think that was sort of part of my question. So there are programs opening up, but there could be more coming up as the regulations change. Yeah, what, what we did, um, a little bit differently this year was that for our recreation programs and recreation activities, um, rather than sort of releasing everything at once that as we normally would do, um, you know, in mid March, we um, are trying to do more of a rolling rollout um, so that we can adapt and alter a program if we're allowed and able to safely do that. Um, so we'll continue to do that as the, the weeks go on. Cool. And I'll add on to that, that the summer rec guide is released and the day, the sign up day is what, next Tuesday, the 13th. Um, yep. And, uh, and so there's, uh, I would say all, all the, I, I looked at it you know, pretty thoroughly trying to, trying to figure out what my kids would be doing. And, and it's all outdoor stuff, um, including many rainbow summer uh, sessions, the horse camp, and then all of the athletic outdoor athletic stuff, you know, soccer camps and other sports type camps, and then several virtual ones that sort of can't help but be inside, like chess camp was, was I think, virtual, at least for the first round. But the signups are, uh, on in April, it's for the first half of the summer, for the first five weeks. And then in May, uh, it's for the second five weeks. And I gather that the hope is that there may be be a couple things that get added for those second five weeks, perhaps, um, as circumstances dictate. Is that? Yes, that's the idea that uh, we, yeah. can, we can adapt to whatever new guidelines are out. Sure. Yeah, cool. Um, with uh, Christy Asmussen, if I should add one thing, and I know, um, you know, I think the community, uh, we're really grateful for all the city has done here to try to, um, you know, put programs in place that maintain safety, but, you know, give kids the, and families the opportunity to engage. I know we started AYSO a couple weeks ago, and it's with masks and, you know, lots of, of control, but, but they're allowed to have competition, allowed to have scrimmages and, you know, five on five games. And, the level of joy, uh, you know, in the players is easily measurable. I mean, even with all the restrictions in place, just being outside and being able to play with their friends and it's just really powerful. So a lot of gratitude for you for, for navigating those very challenging situations um, and, and as best as we can getting it out and, uh, and getting kids outside and playing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with this new, uh, th with vaccines being available to 16 plus now in Davis, are we doing anything to promote that? I mean, you said it's going to be on the website, but are we sort of like blasting that in any way or really encouraging our high school kids that are over 16 to get vaccinated? Yeah, so there's a tiered communication strategy for all of this, which is a district website, school website, and then individual blasts from the appropriate, you know, principals, sometimes elementary. Uh, sometimes secondary, um, you know, to make sure we are um, you know, reaching people in a variety of levels and then on all the social media channels, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, um, and Instagram. Mm -hmm. and, and do you know, I assume UC Davis must be doing something similar for the college kids. They're pretty well resourced on the PR side, especially right now. <laughs> nice way to put it. 
Well, and, and the vaccine availability side of things, as I understand it, they, they have vaccines that are available to the UC system, um, that, which is, I think, more specific to UC, of course. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what age group necessarily that we're the most worried about, you know, wanting to intermingle, but we want to make sure that we're getting all the ones that might be out there ready to be social. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm wanna, I, that actually, if I may, that brings up actually a reminder of one thing that we are talking about with the Healthy Davis Together and the business uh, support programs and so forth is, um, yeah, there there is at at some point here there is going to be a wind a wind down, if you will, of of some of the grant business grant support programs and so forth as things open up more and they can be more self sufficient, if you will. Um, but one of the areas that we're really looking at is. Uh, those businesses who may cater more specifically to youth uh, and popu the the which will be the probably the primary population that will be least vaccinated, if you will, <laughs> uh, moving forward. Things like pediatric offices and and so forth uh, that um, where those businesses may still need some on more ongoing support in order to provide safe environments uh, uh, moving forward. So that the age grouping uh, discussion is definitely in the at the forefront of the conversations there. Yeah, I would just add one additional thing. Um, Chief Pytel has been working with a group of parents to see if there are ways to um, host a uh, an activity for seniors. Um, not a prom, but whatever something would look like that's not a prom. <laughs> so um, he's, he's been working with them on that pretty closely and um, you know, trying, trying to accommodate something that's appropriate and safe. Yeah, I'm sure that they'll appreciate that. Um, do we have, you know, I know that we, UC Davis can test people that are residents of Davis, but they, we can also test anybody that is associated with Davis, like works with Dave, in Davis or has family that works in Davis or things like that. Do we have any data about rates from people that live in Davis versus people that don't live in Davis? Do we know anything about that? I, I don't offhand, uh, but I, I know that they have a wealth of data uh, from the testing. How much of it is public? I'm not sure, but um, so, I mean, it's a good question, I, but I, I don't know off the top of my head, but we could certainly circle back. Yeah, I think it would be interesting. Yeah. Um, cool. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Good. All righty. Do we have more on coordination with UC Davis, Healthy Davis together? The next agenda item. We've covered it. Nothing, nothing more for me. All right, moving on to the SACOG grant. Yeah, so just to introduce it real quick and then I'll turn it over to Kelly who I know got some updates from our staff team. Uh, but uh, as you know, we, we partnered uh, on putting forth a uh, out grant application to SACOG for the Anderson Road Chavez frontage um, sort of rearrangement and improvements uh, to really try to improve the flow of things and the safety of things uh, with the drop off um, uh, for that site, especially given that it's a site that has greater vehicle pickup and drop off uh, by its nature, of course. Um, and so we put in that application at SACOG uh, last week. Uh, we uh, learned that the recommendation was to include uh, in the in the funding package full funding uh, for the uh, the request, uh, which I think was about three million dollars, um, three three point one million, I think. Uh, so fully funded, uh, which is absolutely fantastic news. Uh, so a very strong application and uh, very proud of the effort that was put forward there. So Kelly, I think you have some, they, their board is acting, I believe it's uh, next week. Yeah, on the 15th. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So Kelly, let me turn over to you for some additional updates and next steps. Yeah. Um, yeah so the SACOG board will meet on the 14th and um, formalize, well, we hope formalize that recommendation. Um, they they generally do. So after the 14th, we'll be able to um, really start to plan for certain. Um, we can start uh, actually accessing the funding at the beginning of our fiscal year. So starting as early as July 1. Um, and we would actually at that point initiate the design process. And that would include another round of community input. So if anybody wanted to provide input and they didn't get a chance before, um, or they wanna reiterate, they'll, they'll be able to do that again. 
And then what we'll need to figure out from there, um, we've programmed construction for the fiscal year 22-23. And what we'll need to figure out is whether or not, um, we won't know this right away, but whether or not it's gonna be more likely in the summer of 2022 or the summer of 2023. So um, that'll be some conversation we'll wanna have with the district when we get you know, a little bit closer to that decision point. Um, but pretty excited about the, the um, grant recommendation and the, the project, so. Matt, did, did you, you look like you maybe had something to add there? Oh, no, I was waving somebody going by. Oh, yeah, okay. awesome. <laughs> awesome right. opportunity. Oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, yeah. so, so excited. That's going to be a great improvement there. And, uh, you know, that campus will see a couple of really great projects that will really enhance the, the campus within a really short window. For sure. Yeah, for, for those listening who may not know, so the NPR um, is... Um, we're going to break ground this summer, right, Matt, and be finished by uh, by the summer of 22. Is that the plan? Yeah, yeah it'll be breaking ground like in the next month, probably. Long overdue for that campus. <laughs> so just in addition, there's two other grants that were SACOG grant proposals. Um, good news, some, one good news and one bad news. Um, one is the H Street Tunnel, so the one that runs between the Little League fields and uh, close over to Holmes Junior High. Um, we were also recommended for um, 1.8 million for that project, which is about a, a little over a $2 million project. So that is um, fantastic. And we'll have to, we're still working out the construction schedule, but that will um, provide some improvements for that tunnel, uh, making it a little, little bit safer and um, uh, provide some other enhancements to it. And then the last one that was a SACOG grant um, that we did not, we were not recommended for at this point are the, the changes for the Tulip and Ponte Verde intersection. So we'll still be working through uh, our other options for that. So those are both key uh, school routes for a lot of folks. Yeah, thanks. Superintendent Bose, did you have anything to add on this? No, that was a pretty good update. Great. Any questions or comments? Welcome, Josh. Uh, cool. Well, that's really great. I, I'm glad to hear it will happen in the summertime for uh, the SACOG, for the Anderson route. Um, and definitely have known a lot of people that have you know, fallen on that H Street tunnel. So glad to hear that <laughs> that's up for some improvements as well. The tight turn in there, especially for little kiddos. <clears throat> uh, great. Alrighty. Any announcements or comments? So did you want to go back to a construction update or? Oh, sorry about that. Yes. Facilities and construction project updates. Skipped right over it when I went past the Healthy Davis together. Yeah, no, no problem. Make it quick. Uh, so uh, you've probably seen the work over at Korematsu. Um, they're working on uh, interior finishes and casework, site pavings being completed. The project uh, should be completed uh, by June. Um, and we're hoping to do summer school programming over there for preschool. So looking to put that into use uh, right away. Uh, over at Emerson Da Vinci Junior High, uh, the foundations for the buildings are being uh, poured next week. Um, and we're expecting the buildings to be delivered uh, later this month. And are on track for a uh, uh, late spring, early summer opening um, and will likely be in use uh, for fall uh, of 2021, but probably won't make it for occupancy this spring. Uh, the Birch Lane project is under construction. Um, there's a big, uh, a big uh, lay down area where the building's being constructed. Um, grading and the fire grading and fire lane work is uh, currently underway. Uh, for these projects that are breaking ground, timing probably couldn't be any worse. But uh, we're working with principals to try to minimize the construction-related impacts related to reopening. That project is set to be completed in April of 2022. The next three uh, MPR projects: Willett, uh, North Davis, uh, and uh, Chavez are all mobilizing construction. Um, at Willett and North Davis, uh, construction will start the end of this month. 
um, and the uh, uh, postings on the tennis courts over at Willet have already been uh, posted. Those that, that those are being closed and uh, mobilization is starting. Uh, at Chavez, mobilization um, is set uh, to start uh, in mid June, primarily because we got to move the uh, Catalyst uh, Kid classes um, and need to wait till schools out to do that. The other NPR project uh, is the, the Da Vinci Tech Hub. Uh, and we expect to start construction uh, mid-summer, uh, looking for July to start the, uh, the construction laydowns. That project will be about 14 months in duration. So uh, probably not gonna make the start of school for 2022, but should be open shortly thereafter. Uh, and the other uh, four NPR projects are all uh, 12 month duration and they should all be open for the fall of 2022. Davis High roof projects, we sent out a notice uh, for public feedback on the current plan. Uh, I think last week, maybe a week before, uh, those the CTE and Aquatic Center programmings are all uh, in design. Um, and those projects uh, will take about a year to complete. We're expecting uh, summer of uh, 22 for uh, construction to start on both of those projects uh, for fall opening fall of 23. We do plan to re-roof the S -Sci old science wing, the S wing over at Davis High this summer. Um, and Dave wanted me to give a big shout out to um, the city departments, a lot of collaboration happening right now. Uh, super appreciative of the engineering department's input and cooperation. Lots of work with the fire marshal uh, to make sure that these uh, construction projects have adequate um, uh, you know, safety access. Um, I think that's all I got. I'll take questions if there are any. Any questions? Matt, on the uh, one project that we'll want to make sure we coordinate on moving forward is we're, we're, we have a bid uh, process underway right now for our sport court resurfacing uh, project. We were actually just, Kelly and a few others and I were just meeting on this earlier today. Uh, and one of those is uh, Redwood at Redwood Park next to Chavez. And so we'll wanna make sure we coordinate closely on the timing just to make sure we're not, I mean, they, they don't overlap in footprint of course, but in terms of logistics and construction vehicles and you know, lay down space and all that, we'll wanna make sure we coordinate and, and that we're not stepping on toes. Yeah, definitely so. At, yeah. at that same park, we also have um, uh, play equipment replacement at That's some right. point this summer. So there's just going to yeah. be a lot of activity in that area over the next couple months. Yeah. yeah. All good things, you yeah, know, for sure. <laughs> I walk my dog there every day, so I'll make sure to provide daily reports to this group. <laughs> well, on, have... on leash, of course, I bet. Right? Right, Joe? Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm okay. a rule follower, Mike. You know that. <laughs> um, we have I do another... have... I... Oh, I'm sorry, Kelly. No, go ahead. Go ahead. So I do want to have one, just one comment, uh, Trustee Asmussen, uh, which is that I, I want to again express my gratitude to uh, my colleagues on the city council and at the city for uh, being so flexible on the tennis court space at Willett. Um, you know, you all moved that agreement forward quickly, which enabled us to uh, have the Willett NPR happen at the same time as the others, uh, which both, you know, helps us to deliver a great service for those students and families and the community because there'll be community accessibility, um, you know, but also it's going to save us a bunch of money uh, because the, you know, the team has done a great job of putting these bids together and ultimately we're going to be able to build our facilities for less because we were able to group those. So just gratitude to, to the city and city council for enabling us to do that. Thank you. Any other Thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate it. There are a number of um, other city, uh, primarily pavement rehabilitation projects that will be going on um, primarily this summer um, in the vicinity, direct vicinity of several of the schools. Um, in addition to the, the work over in Redwood Park next to Chavez that Mike mentioned, um, there'll be some uh, pavement rehabilitation work uh, near Patwin and Emerson um, on Arlington, I think from Calaveras to Shasta or somewhere right along that, that location. Um, North Davis Elementary and Davis High, there'll be some pavement rehabilitation on F Street, basically from um, downtown all the way to Covell and then along Covell from, from F all the way out to 113. Um, 
the high school in the summer, actually, sorry, in September, there'll be the, the pilot project that reconfigures Oak and 14th Street intersection that um, we weren't able to do earlier. But so we're, we're scheduling that or slating that for September. Um, and then at the admin building for the district, uh, we'll be replacing a signal, a light signal um, this summer. So there'll be some, some disruption there. And then the last thing is um, at Marguerite, Marguerite Montgomery, um, we'll be beginning in not too terribly long, uh, work on some of the Safe Routes to School enhancements that will go along Lillard and Danbury that then tie into the, um, the uh, bridge slash connection with Pole Line and Olive Drive. So we, we have a lot going on too. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Um, I know you've been doing outreach with on that bridge project. It, do you know if you've gotten a lot, or maybe there's a question for Josh even, you know, has the MME community been able to give some input on that? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Does anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> I know I would, uh, yeah, I would. I know that there's been outreach efforts that have been happening. I think the the greater focus of them up until recently has been more about the bridge connection itself over and more of the Olive Drive neighborhood and the impacts associated with that because that's the part of the construction that's happening now. Um, and so a lot of the efforts, the outreach efforts were focusing on that. I think uh, my understanding is that there's plans for additional outreach more in the Marguerite Montgomery neighborhood around the, what is primarily striping, um, street striping and uh, some uh, adjustments there. Um, and that that's sort of a, it's, related to the olive drive connection piece but it's ver in all respects sort of a separate very separate component of the project that'll be later in the year um but and it, J josh i believe has been privy to some of those uh outreach meetings as well he may have some additional insights or uh kelly i don't know if he had additional ins uh, updates from staff on that one or not i i don't i'm happy to circle back with um bob clark and see if there's been any info but yeah yeah we, there was a community meeting, uh, I believe it was probably three weeks ago now, um, where public works and city staff were there um, and discussed the, the whole project at length. Um, and then there were um, definitely representatives from the PTA and other kind of MME leadership and folks, myself and other people that were on that call, um, that were the vast majority of those questions focused around the work being done by Montgomery and, and the way that um, students are getting from um, kind of, you know, north of Lillard and how they're able to get from those pockets over to school without doing big circular roundabouts on the bike path. Um, so there was definitely some discussion around that. Um, and I don't know where, you know, logistically where that goes. I, I think it's pretty sure it's slated to start up here pretty soon um, in the summer, the restriping work over there. Um, so there was a community meeting, like I said, I think it was maybe three or four weeks ago. Yeah, I think what we what we should do is follow up with uh, we'll follow up with, with Bob's team and then the communicate our communications team too and see what the plans are for the next steps for outreach and so forth because we want to make sure that we're thoroughly engaged there with that school population and and the neighbors uh, as well uh, of course um, uh, well before any sort of paint is being put on on the ground <laughs> for the striping to make sure that there's clarity on what's being done, why it's being done, and if there is any need for sort of last minute adjustments that there's still an opportunity arguably to, to do that. So yeah, so we will, we will circle back on that. Trustee Asmussen and colleagues, I apologize. Uh, my TA just reminded me, I'm supposed to be teaching a class, so I am gonna have to sign off. Thank you for everyone. Cheers. See you, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Okay, that sounds good. I just want to make sure that, you know, we're facilitating any communication or involvement with the community. You know, we want to make sure that the school community gives input where they need to. Um, can you tell me what the Oak and 14th uh, intersection is? You said it's going to be next September by the high school. Yeah, I mean, in short, it's a, it's a, a grant that we had uh, received. Actually, it goes back about two years ago now. So it was about a year before COVID. So yeah, about two years ago now um, that we've been in communication with um, the district staff, of course, you know, I think throughout uh, where we were looking to uh, uh, 
pilot basically, so in other words, by, by installing some temporary measures to try some different uh, 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 sort of traffic calming uh, bike ped safety measures along that corridor and at that intersection in particular uh, to try to better sort of organize uh, bikes and peds and cars and uh, just for safer movements. And so the idea there, um, you know, without diagrams, it's a bit challenging, I'd say, but is to um, uh, create some safer spaces that for the more, what I'll call the more vulnerable users uh, at that intersection into in a, in, a, in a test, sort of a test case by installing some very temporary measures uh, to try to test to see how they, how they work and if they're effective before going to a next stage of more permanent uh, uh, solutions. Um, and so um, basically with in response to um, several years of concerns about, you know, speeds about stopping and vehicle movements, uh, and I think which tends to be especially true more around the high school, uh, where you have newer drivers and uh, so forth that are going in and out of campus. It also involves the frontage where there's a uh, bus stop access uh, along the frontage of the high school and then the driveways going in and out of the, the parking lot there um, and trying to implement some measures that would uh, create just greater safety uh, all around uh, for that. So that's, that's a basic, really very rudimentary overview, I'll call it, but there are plans hey, and concepts that have been developed, yeah. Are those, are those diagrams available somewhere for, for us to look at? They're not, yeah. are they online? Yeah, we've done that. We've done outreach meetings. Um, including I've seen the, them. I just don't. I haven't looked yeah. them up online before. Yeah, yeah, we we do. Uh, we could provide provide a link to the group. Yeah, that that might be good. Cool. Thank you. So it's not like a construction that's going to happen in September after school has started. It's things that we're going to try out. Yeah. Again, very temporary. Some of it is, I, I think, with like some temporary like cone type structures or maybe some uh, removable uh, striping um, uh, that goes on that goes down. And then the idea is to, to put in place some monitoring of that so that we can actually have assessment in real time over, you know, our speeds actually being reduced, are people making sort of safe turn movements and so forth. Yeah. So we're I'm deliberately wanting to do it when school is in session so that there's a measurement component. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That sounds really interesting. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Announcements or comments? Uh, one one thing I, I know that has been of interest to the district, and I know John's been engaged in some discussions, as has uh, Josh and Will, uh, for that matter, is the uh, uh, the South Davis Library discussions with the county, um, and I think we're, I think we have another follow up meeting that's that's coming up pretty soon, on the project concept. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow. That's right. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's already Wednesday, isn't it? Um, so, uh, wasn't sure if there's anything in particular that we wanted to talk about or bring up there, but because there is a meeting uh, coming up tomorrow. Uh, yeah, at three o'clock. Um, thought it might be a good opportunity to see if there are questions or anything that's on the mind of the group that you'd want to make sure that we bring up uh, during that discussion. We'd be certainly happy to. Uh, what 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 point are we like? What's the meeting for? The meeting uh, is to um, continue the discussion, which has been going on for two or three years about the possible development of a South Davis library program. The specific topic of this meeting is to review uh, what a proposed annual operating budget uh, for the facility uh, may be. And those documents were just shared with the uh, respective uh, EJUSD trustees and city council members on the two by two by two uh, either yesterday or today. So those are relatively recent documents. Yeah. I do not personally have any questions, but I'll be interested to hear how it goes. Any other announcements or comments? OK, 
Okay, so I think the next thing that I do is adjourn. Yes. Thank you, Big Dis. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. My first one. <laughs> Rip the band off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Right. Talk to you soon. <laughs>